All right. Um, hello and welcome to my second talk of the day in the back of base, a back to basics track. I'm, I'm happy to be back there. Um, topic of today is move semantics. I'm Andreas Fertig. I work as a trainer and consultant for C++. I'm also the author of a couple of C++ books and I'm as well the author of a tool called C++ Insights, which we don't use today, at least not as planned. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A if you happen to have one during the talk. I will either answer them somewhere during the session or at the end of the session, there should be time left for questions, all right? So um, then let's dive in here. Maybe one, one thing before we directly go into the topic. There are previous talks um, in the Back to Basics track from last year, previous years, where people also talked about move semantics. So that might also be something you want to check out later. Everything is on YouTube, so you can enjoy that. But now let's go to my talk. And I guess I, I use a rather unusual approach teaching move semantics, because I think it's not that awfully complicated as a lot of people often feel or think. So, Here's a picture and I'm trying to build an analogy for what's coming up in move semantics. So on the left in this picture, we have copy. And this is the only option that we had in C++ 98. And if you have only one option, it's always a total valid option. So, and even today, copy is still a valid option. It depends now on what we want. But let's look at copy. So assume that there is a company in the US that wants to hire me. Um, they want to give me a job and they pay me a fortune of money. So I like the job, the money is okay. So I say, yeah, well, I come to you. And I'm in Germany currently. So yeah, the job is in the US. They don't like remote work. So they really want me to be on site. So I do the one crazy thing. I say, yeah, all right, let, let's do that. And I look for an apartment like mine in the US. And guess what? I managed to find one. It's, it's totally amazing and no clue how I did that. But I found the exact same apartment as I currently have in Stuttgart, somewhere in the US. And then I spend an awful lot of time in, in this Swedish furniture store. So I'm, getting all my furniture. And things get complicated there because my couch um, is from a different supplier that went out of business. My kitchen is from a supplier who also went out of business. So let's simply say I managed that somehow. And as an end result, I have the exact same apartment in Stuttgart and in the US. It's amazing. And what are the implications? It means I spend an awful lot of resources on their project, time and money. The endless hours getting everything a second time. The money, pay, paying everything a second time, buying that. Uh, it's incredible. And if in person you would tell me you're crazy, I would say, yeah, you, you, you're totally right. There are potentially only a very few people in this world who do something like that really duplicate their apartment. I'm not sure if there is any person who this, does this in respect to simply having multiple apartments, but I am duplicating mine, I'm copying mine. So a total crazy thing. And it's hard to estimate how much time or money it will cost me. So the resources, well, they, I have to have them, right? And that brings me to the more sane solution we do usually when we talk about moving. We relocate. So we move all our furniture, all the contents of our former apartment to our new one. So that for me, that means moving all the stuff from Stuttgart to the US. And even that's a oh, good distance, it's much cheaper than the copy because it means that I control the resources. For doing that move, I hire a moving company. They told me upfront how long it takes, when they start the move, 
and what it costs. And there is a good chance that all that happens in one or two days, maybe to the US, it's a little bit longer depending on what they use to ship the furniture over. But it will cost in the end less money and less time than my duplication. Okay, so this is the vision for move semantics. We want to be fast and we want to be constant in time. That's move semantics. And that's the idea here. And if we transform that into code, then we can say, hey, for copy, I have this function copy that takes a pointer to a pointer, char, a uh, source, and dest, and a size t for the length of the source array, right? The source string. And then in this function here in line number three, I'm using new to allocate a new char array up to the size provided by the size parameter. And then in line number four, I'm using memcopy to copying all the data from source to destination. These two lines, they look so cheap, but they are so expensive. And both depend on the size. So the execution time, at least for the memcopy, varies with the number of bytes we want to copy. Most likely it does so as well for the allocation in new. Maybe of an allocator down that does that in constant time, but it's not always the case. And even if you have that, it means you're reaching for global memory. No matter how many CPUs you have, there is only one global memory that has an impact. So that single line on number three, that's not so innocent as it looks like, nor is the line number four. So this is costing the resources here in terms of time and also in terms of memory consumption, because now for some uncertain time, I'm using twice as much memory for source and destination than I would really need if I would move. So this is copy. And as I said, it's, it's totally fine if copy is the thing we need. There are dozens of scenarios like duplicating strings where copy is absolutely fine. But there are other scenarios where we say, no, we, we, we don't want really, or we don't need to copy. We can move the resource over. And that's on the right-hand side at the bottom. There, my function signature only takes two parameters, both pointers to pointers, source and destination, no size parameter. And internally, that function does nothing other than using the source per pointer, assigning it to the destination pointer, and setting the source pointer to null pointer. Okay, because in both scenarios, we assume that the destination came empty, it was the same for copy. So that's it. And the brilliancy about the code on the right-hand side is it does not depend on a size parameter. It cannot. There is no such parameter. That means it's constant in time. It does not depend on how many data we are copying. And the other thing is these are two pointer operations. You hardly find something in your CPU that's faster. There is one and there are zero pointer operations. Okay, so you're basically using one of the fastest things that your CPU offers you. And you don't need to reallocate or freshly allocate memory. So these two lines are way faster than the one on the left. And that's the other thing about move semantics. They come into play if we have dynamic memory and we can swap pointers internally in our objects there we swap the pointers. And whether it's a full or a partial swap, we will see more about that later, doesn't matter. It's the I use that and swap it with that thing that makes move semantics, move operations fast. That's the only thing. There is no such thing as, as really moving your memory. That's um, up to languages which have a virtual machine under them. So it's, it's simply about swapping pointers. If you happen to have objects which don't have pointers, which don't have dynamic memory, we will not get anything from move semantics. Okay, at least if none of the objects contained in the object and so forth doesn't have pointer stored. You might still get a win if you have your own local heaps, because allocating from them still is a um, time-consuming operation, and you can keep the pressure on this memory system still low. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the global heap but it must be pointers. Then you get your performance win, okay? So this is the, the big picture.
two different operations. Now let's dive in. Um, what are move semantics? What are move operations? Hello, well, let's one, once again start with C++ 98. I assume what you see on this slide you already know. I have here two functions, so they practically overload each other, called fun. One takes a std vector of int by reference, and the other one takes a std vector of int by const reference. That's simple overloading. And then internally, they don't do anything with the vectors. I simply use them to print out which one got called, right? So you all know that, correct? No surprises here. And now I fire a couple of calls to fun. In use here below, I create first in line number three, a std vector of v with a couple of numbers in it. It's also a std vector of int. And then line number four, I'm creating a const vector of int with another couple of num numbers naming it cv. So two std vectors, one is const, one isn't. And now in line number six to eight, I'm placing calls to fun. I'm calling fun with the modifiable std vector v. And that means that in the term that we will learn more later about, that's an L value. And then in line number seven, I call fun with the const vector cv. So this is a const L value. And in line number eight in C, I'm doing something different. I'm creating that std vector in place. So this is a so-called temporary object. So here I'm passing a temporary object. And the difference between the temporary object and the other two is that one will go out of scope. The others are variables. They live longer. Maybe my function uses to end here. But my temporary goes out of scope after I hit the semicolon. So I know that. And we all know so the vector internally allocates memory, right? Dynamic memory. So if I now run this program, then I get a following output. The first call to fun A results in a call of the function by ref. The call in B results in the function by const ref being called. And so does the temporary object in C that also calls by const ref. We learned that we can catch a temporary either by using a value parameter, so by copy, or catching it with a const reference to extend its lifetime to catch it. So no surprises here, right? That's the things we already had in C++ 98. And now what move semantics is about is this case in line number C, or in C, sorry, in line number eight, the temporary object, because here is an advantage. For this temporary object, we can say, it allocates dynamic memory. And I want to be able to steal that in fun to utilize it longer than it would live otherwise. So imagine fun always being bigger, maybe allocating a class and then returning that one, things like that. So you really use that memory for a long time. And before move semantics, we had to copy at some point. And that was expensive because remember, we, we duplicate all these things. And what if we could simply rip the memory from that temporary object, swap it with, with something empty, whatever. Okay, we want that memory. We don't want another allocation. So what do we do? We add another overload. That one you see in line number 11, an additional overload to fun, taking a std vector of int by ref ref, that's an R value reference, the two ampersands there. It's not const because we want to modify it, but two ampersands. And that's, you can say for now, it's a move reference. This triggers move semantics. And if I now execute the same calls as before, we will see a different output. What we see now is the first call to fun for my vector v calls by ref. The second one for my const vector calls by const ref. And the third one with the temporary object, that one now ends up in the new function by move ref. And that's it. At this point, technically we can finish. Move semantics are nothing else than another overload. And temporaries trigger that overload. Move semantics are made to catch temporaries such that we can reuse the dynamic memory in them. And that's all. 
And technically, I could now close the talk after 16 minutes. But there are a couple of things like, well, maybe we have more circumstances where we want to trigger that overload and how does it look for classes and so forth, right? So let's continue. Sometimes we have the scenario that we have, like here in, in the example below in line number three, we have this two vector, but we know we don't use it, we don't need it anymore after line five. So basically we want to pass that to our R value overload to the one in line number 11 at the top, the new one we added. And what we can do then is, you see it, it's another overload. So we can use a cast to cast that object into the desired matching overload signature. And what we do here below in line number five is you apply a static cast, casting our vector v to a stood vector of int of type ref ref or qualified by ref ref. So we are making that one an R value reference. So there's nothing then changing for the compiler the signature of this parameter or value at this point variable, such that it later triggers my move overload, my R value overload. And if you do that and execute it, we can see now this single statement triggers my by move ref overload. And this is what we want. We want to be able for some objects to give up control, to say, well, I don't need that one any longer. And what you usually do at this point or what you see in code is not that people say the static cast, it's an awfully long thing and a lot of repetition. What we have here instead is what you see in line number seven, a std move. Okay, we need a utility header for that. That's where std move is in. And the crucial part here is despite that it's named std move, it's the static cast I just showed you. So when you say move, nothing really is moved. Just the value category gets changed such that the proper overload gets picked. Okay, so this is what std move does. It doesn't mean that the moment you're saying std move, you lost everything or there is a real move happening. It's just triggering the right overload. Okay, so some notes. Um, std move is only a cast. It's just a fancy name for a cast. And the overloads can move if they exist. If I don't have an overload using ref ref, then I might end up calling the construct version. Okay. Temporary objects are picked up by default when we have move operations in place. And this is the thing we are reaching out for. The main thing is catching temporary objects. And the things I just showed you are additional things where we help the compiler telling them, well, we don't need that one anymore. But the main thing is temporary objects. So only if we have an object we no longer want to use, we can say std move, and then it's reasonable. That means move semantics is nothing else, as I repeatedly said, than an additional overload that is allowed and expected to steal the data from our source object. That's move semantics. It's stealing. It's theft at the end. Very interesting, right? So now I use the term L and R value references. There's no good way around them. So let me briefly introduce them. And once again, here's the notation from C++ 98. And it predates C++ by a long time. The terms were coined way before. C does only use L value. Um, only C++ uses L and R value references, but um, it even predates C, the notation here. So the initial meaning was L value is everything that's on the left side of the equal sign while an R value is everything that's on the right hand side of the equal sign. That means mostly that R values produce a new value while L values store them, catch them. L values are things we can name, we can get the address from, things like that. R values like the result here in ob object three from a function call, we don't know the address, we don't know the name, we have to assign it to some L value to get our hands on it can only pass it to another function, okay? So in, in C++ 98, obviously we didn't have object four, so there was no std move. Now the things changed a little because we needed a, a finer definition for that when move semantics came along. 
So this is how it looks in C++11 and later. On the top right, you have a graph illustrating how the things clue together here. But if we refer to the code, then we can still say we have L values, that's still everything on the left of the equal sign. And of course, also the thing on the right base, if we use a variable name, just because we put it on the right of the equal sign doesn't mean it's a different value category. It's still an L value. Okay, and that's important for move semantics because object three and object four, here we have a call to get value. It's a function and I provided you the signature behind it. Get value returns a object or something of type object by ref ref. So that's a temporary. It returns an R value reference. That means temporary. Stood move does the cast, but it casts it to the exact same signature. So object three and object four, the things on the right, they are called X values for expiring values, values that will soon expire because after the semicolon, if you don't do anything with them, they are gone. In our case, we are assigning them to something. But this assignment here means if the class, our object object has a move constructor or move assignment operator, that one will be picked because these are temporary objects. And then we have the other two things in object five and six. These are so-called PR values for pure R values. And the signature for my gut other function now is that it returns an object. So this is not a temporary object technically, it's an object. And the number five is also nothing temporary. It exists somewhere in our code base, but still we don't know the address of it. We cannot name it other than typing the number five. So these are different types of, of R values. And then there's the notation for an GL value. That's a generalized L value. And that means everything like an L or an X value is a GL value. And you see it in the graph um, at the top. If you have an expression, we can separate it in a GL value and an R value. And then we can say a GL value, that's either an L value or an X value while an R value can also be an X value or a PR value. But let's not get crazy over and with these things. So the mental model is we have L values on the right. I will mostly refer to everything what's on the right as an R value, but you have now seen and know that there's a difference technically between the different kinds of R values we can have on the right. And sometimes they make a difference, but in the beginning, just distinguish or yeah, differentiate between temporary objects and normal objects who are not temporary. So let's look at an example. Where is this place of a potential performance win in real code? So I picked the example of the class string. So like the std string in the standard library. I took a couple of um, implementation decisions here, which I think usual implementation in the standard library don't do. So in line number two, we see the usual lengths for storing the lengths to the string, it's a size t, and that decided that I store a pointer to the data in a std unique pointer that one takes an array of chars, and I call that one data. That spares me creating a default constructor, having a destructor and a couple of delete operations. So it makes my code shorter, which is excellent for slides here. And then in line six, I have a constructor taking a const char star, of course, it's a string. And then in line number eight and nine, you can see the copy operations, copy constructor and copy assignment operator. You know them as well. So that's fine, nothing new. New is line number 11 and 12. These are the move constructor in C and the move assignment operator in D. So these are the two new functions. And now you can see the, the principle is the same. They are simply different overloads to the existing ones. Instead of saying const string ref, I'm saying string ref ref. And it's the same as with the function I showed you before. These two, C and D, they are supposed to catch temporary. So everything would move into our std string. And then finally in C, of course, we need a or sorry, in line number 14, we need a C string function to convert um, our string to a C string. 
operating it out, right? So first implementation here is the copy operations. You know that potentially you have done something like that in the past. As I said, I'm using the unique pointer here. So my copy constructor sets the length from the right-hand side string and it allocates it with make unique, a new unique pointer up to the length of our right-hand side string. And then in line number four, I'm using std copy to copy the data from the source to the destination. Well, nothing fancy. And the same is in the assignment operator. Here in line number 10 to 12, you can see I'm using the lengths from the right-hand side, of course. And I once again use make unique, allocate the proper lengths, and assign it newly allocated memory to M data. And this way, the unique pointer here excels. I don't have to free the existing M data. It simply gets freed automatically because of the unique pointer. So that's great. And then in line number 12, the copy. Okay. So this is the same pattern as I have on my initial slide. These two operations, they are extremely costly depending on the length of your string. Can never say how long they take, depends on the string, depends on your allocated the need. And it varies over time. And it means twice the resources that we actually need, at least for some time. So let's look at the move operations. The move operations are the following. Here you can see first at the top the move constructor. And in line number two, I'm of course setting the length of my new string from the value of the right hand side string. And I'm using a utility function from C17, std exchange. It works the way that we pass in the old value and the new value internally, it not directly swaps them, but um, say it swaps them and returns me the old value, such that I can assign the, the old value to my member m lengths here in the constructor's initializer list. And they do the same with m data. And my std exchange has the duty that it can um, swap the unique pointers. But in our case, because we are in the move constructor, of course, our current um, string is empty. So we set null pointer in here. And then we implement the move assignment operator. And there's a two lines of code in line number eight and nine, you can see that once again, I'm taking the length from the other side and I'm saying std exchange, exchanging the data. This time I'm applying std move on my data and moving that one into the right-hand side and taking over the data from the right-hand side. And despite that I now worked with unique pointers for simplicity reasons, beneath them, we are swapping pointers. Okay, the unique pointers simply swapping pointers. So it's the thing I initially told you about. It's about swapping pointers. There is no memory allocation happening in my move operations. And that's the key here. There is also the rule of thumb that you should not unnecessarily delete or free memory in a move assignment operator, for example, which is the more likely case, because that also means that your timing is no longer constant. And which we will learn on the next slide, the destructor of the right-hand side class will run anyway your object. So that one can take care of freeing the memory and keep your move, opera move operations fast and in time. So constant in time. So these are the move operations. There is one thing we also have to talk about, and this is the move from object. And this is often a source for confusion and for errors. But a move from object is nothing special. The code here illustrates, first of all, what a move from object is. Say I have a string object, call it source, and I assign a string hello to it. And then in line number three, I'm saying I create another st a string object called other. And I'm using std move, moving source into other. And then in line number five, I'm using cout to print out the contents of my source object. And now look at what we are telling not only the compiler, but also our fellow developers. In line number three, we say that source string, we don't want that anymore. We don't need it. So we pass it and all its contents forward to other. 
And then we start reusing init line number five. And that's the issue. After we apply std move to an object, that one becomes a so-called move from object. And such an object is defined to be in a valid yet unknown state. In general, we say there are two types of operations that um, are valid on moved from objects. And that's the destruction. So obviously that object must be destructible and assignable. So we should be able to assign a new value to this move from object. And why is this so hard? In general, there are two types of move semantics across programming languages. We can have a destructive and a non-destructive move. Rust, for example, as far as my knowledge goes, implements the destructive move. And that means that after we say std move in line number three, if you use source, the name source again in line number five, the compiler tells me that this is not valid because that object already got destructed, that name doesn't mean anything anymore. So that makes a couple of things easier. C++, however, implements the non-destructive move. That means that we can still reach that object. This follows the usual C++ um, lifetime rules. The object gets destroyed once we hit the closing scope or say delete. So in that regard, the move semantics and the non-destructive move fits in the language, but it opens the window for the question, what to do with this object in line number five, the move from object. The issue is that this object is in a valid yet unknown state. So it depends on the implementation. We just implemented move operations for our std string. And you saw it's, it's completely up to us, implementation freedom. So before we can use or reuse such a move from object, we have to bring it back in a valid and known state. And we can do that by assigning a new value to it. That should be possible. Destroying it must always be possible because the destructor will run. And usually it's a good idea to also provide an assignment operation. But as for the standard library, you can also find other operations that are safe to call on these types, but this is entirely up to the type author. For example, for a std string, we can call clear. That one resets that object in a valid and known state. The tragedy here is we don't know in which state is in. And why? Because implementation freedom, decisions, decisions, decisions. Here, this is an alternative implementation for our move operations in the class string, and I changed line number eight and nine. Instead of doing a full swap of the right-hand side with the left-hand side, I'm simply setting the right-hand side to zero. So that one looks like an empty string. And then in line number nine, I'm also moving the data from the left-hand side, uh, from the right-hand side into the left hand. So I'm also stealing that right-hand side stood string, making it effectively a null pointer. And that means that a previous version where you see out on that, uh, that will fail badly. Might not even be the best idea to use um, C string at this point together with C out, but that's a different story. You can do different things here. The code in line number nine is potentially not a one you're reaching for because that means that the right hand or the left hand side's uh, memory gets destructed in the move assignment operator. That means that this operation no longer is constant in time. And it also means that if we do the full swap as before, we have a potential that if users want to bring that string object back in a valid and known state, we already have memory reserved for them, which they can reuse. So you can also spare your users, which reuse the move from object, another memory allocation. So but it's up to you, it's decisions, decisions, and decisions. It's, it's C++, you can control the performance you want at this point. So this move from object, it's nothing special. It's just a state where the implementers left the object in. And there are roughly two rules you can follow. The most simplest rule is never touch a move from object. Okay, it's 
brain dead and simple. Treat every stood move like you're in a language with a destructive move. There you cannot touch it anymore, so don't do that in C++ as well. And usually that's good because you just expressed with stood move that you don't want that source object any longer. However, you can also follow another rule, the you know what you're doing rule. And that means you can reuse a move from object once you brought it back in a valid and known state. And for all data types, that's assigning a new value to the move from object or calling other functions that are marked in the documentation as requiring no precondition. Okay, so that means you have your third party library or your own library under control, you know what you're doing, use that rule. And nobody prevents you from mixing the two rules, say 90% of the time following the simple rule and the 10% where you really need a performance and know that's a good idea to reuse the move from object, follow that you know what you're doing rule. So it's up to you, it's your choice. Now, we want to get the best performance out of all that things, right? So how about a standard library, move semantics, and a custom object? I'm presenting you here in line number one to seven, my object, object. It comes with the special member functions, a default constructor, the copy operations, and the move operations, and they all print out once they've been called, such that we can identify which operation gets invoked, okay? And due to slide space, I'm using printf this time. Now in line number 11, I create myself a stood vector of object, we, an empty one. And then in line number 13, I'm using pushback, pushing one object, and see, I'm creating it in place, so it's a temporary object, pushing that object into the stood vector. My objects don't store anything, so it's, it's just foreseeing what happens at this point. And then in line number 15, I'm printing out that a second element was or is about to be pushed back into the stood vector. And I'm calling pushback for a second temporary object. And now if you look at the, the object itself, my question to you is, what's the output? So which functions get invoked? And because we have this indirect way here for the remote session, I am not stalling that real long. So the output is the following. I have, first of all, a constructor call. You can see that here. And that's reasonable. This is the constructor call for constructing the temporary object. And then I have a second call that's to the move constructor. And that is when my pushback moves this temporary object in its memory. So and then we see the output for second element. That's also reasonable. We see another constructor call, of course, the second temporary object. We see a move constructor call, of course, moving this temporary object into our stood vector. And then at least I see something that I don't like. Then we see a call to a copy constructor call. And the question is, where does this come from? And the answer is the following. Our stood vector has an allocation strategy. It starts with zero elements. And once we do the first pushback, it allocates exactly one element. And if you do the second pushback, it starts allocating two elements. And then four, eight, and so forth to a little, be a little bit in advance that don't get carried away by, by pulling all the memory in. So after or during our first pushback, the memory here is blank. So we have one element, we move that one temporary into that memory, that's fine. Things change for our second pushback because for the second pushback, the vector needs to reallocate memory, two elements now. It can move the temporary, the fresh temporary into the newly allocated memory, but what to do with the existing element? And now the standard library gives us the strong exception guarantee. That means if one of the pushback fails and throws an exception, our initial stood vector is still intact. So should a second pushback fail, we have still a stood vector with one element in it. And the problem for the standard library and potentially for you types as well is move operations are other than copy operations destructive. Okay, they don't duplicate. We rip 
or we can at least rip the contents of the other side. And that means if the compiler or the standard library implementation would do a move for the existing element here, they're risking that an exception gets thrown and the initial vector is no longer intact. So to get a best performance out here, we have to tell the compiler and the standard library that our move operations, and I'm only doing that for the move constructor here in Compile Explorer, that that one doesn't throw. And the moment I'm doing that, we can see now the standard library uses move even for the existing element. And that's crucial. There you can also either lose or win performance. Okay. So this is the standard library being real good at exception safety. And move operations are destructive. It's like with the destructor. A destructor also should never throw an exception because it means you're leaking resources. So the same goes for the move operations. Um, they are tampering at least with your resources. So mark your move constructor, your move assignment operator, as you see it on that slide, as no except to get a best performance out for working with the standard library and your custom types. So stood move is not always the right thing. Say we have this function innocent here, which um, may be a bad name for the function, as we will see. And that one takes a std string by reference, we call it value. And then internally in line number three, it allocates a another, another std string, um, a local variable called local. And then I'm using std move to move value into my local variable. Mars. All right. Now in line number eight, you see my attempt to create a very, very long string that I defeat to small string optimization, such that my std string reload allocates memory. And then in line number 12, I'm passing that stood string s to my function innocent. And then I'm printing out after that with the out the contents of my very, very long string to defeat a small string optimization. And the output is the following. It's empty. My object s is empty. And that's because in line number three, I set std move on that reference. And a reference means that I reach directly to the source, to the origin. And I'm ripping the contents off from that string. And that's a real bad thing because this is a real theft. We are stealing here the memory, the contents from a caller who does not expect that. That's something you should never do. So be cautious using std move in these scenarios. It's usually not wise to use std move on a reference value, at least not on a reference parameter, because then you risk doing that. So if you modify that function a little and say, okay, now let it become a function template. That one takes a type name t as a single parameter and my function innocent now takes a t ref ref. So that's an R value reference. And in that exact combination, it's also called a forwarding reference. The rest of innocent remains the same. Line number four, we still say stood move. The rest of the code below is also the same. We call innocent with our long std string, and then we're printing it out. And we will see the exact same result. It's empty, okay? Because the template and the R value references here don't help us, we are still passing a L value and not a temporary or a std moved made temporary, if you like so. So the right thing to do here is to use another element of the standard library stood forward, as you can see it in line number four. Inside templates, where you have the combination t ref ref, so a type that used parameter and the two ampersands for our values, you want to say stood forward, because this is a template and we will get a different instantiation for an L and for an R value. So in my case, I get only one instantiation, that's one L value. If I pass the temporary to innocent, I will get a second one for an R value. And stood forward now internally can decide whether it's an L or an R value. It uses function overloads and it either says stood move if it's an R value or it simply passes the value or keeps the value category if it's not a temporary. So this is what stood forward does. And this is simply forwarding the value, preserving the value category. And 
you can think about stood forward always if you have a template parameter t which belongs to the variable to the parameter you're attaching then it stood forward because stood move doesn't need an additional parameter only stood forward so and if i do that then we can see my caller now is happy because the string remains where it was previously so no stealing here which is the right thing to do we can say if we have the signature fun object p so a function which returns void and takes a parameter object by value then is the action stood move on p is safe because p now is owned by the function fun we can move that nobody from the outside can reach it if i have a class template uh, sorry if i have a function template fun which takes a t ref ref p then as we just saw the right thing to do here is to say stood forward remember it's triggering the right overloads preserving in this case that the right overload is triggered and then if you have a variable object o some values being constructed then you can say stood move from o it's your variable it's it's local somewhere you can move it the same goes if you have auto ref ref for a variable o then this time auto means type deduction and i have an auto ref ref and that means i'm needing stood forward just that this time because the type is hidden behind the auto i must use decal type of o to get the type back which stood forward needs but my object o here or my variable o pardon me um that can be the result of a function call and, and maybe that's simply an r or an l value reference and then we would rip the caller once again if he says to move so remember in these cases always say stood forward and, and the stood forward thing that also comes to play when we talk about perfect forwarding so what i have here is i have a sample class apple that takes a stood string in its copy constructor or in a constructor and it has a constructor taking a stood string by an r value reference and it prints out l and r value as well as the string and now i have one of these things that we have so much about in, in the standard library these days in line number seven to eleven i have one of these make functions like you previously saw and know potentially with make unique make shared make optional and all that make pair so my make function is a function template takes two parameters t and u and as it's um function parameters in line number eight it takes a u ref ref so that's a forwarding reference and why it's a forwarding reference because it can be an l or an r value and we want to preserve that value category so then in line number 10 i'm creating an object of type t and i forward the value u i received in make as a parameter to the constructor of t so that function make here is absolutely no clue what values type is and for make unique and all the others we usually have um variety templates so this is to pass an arbitrary number of parameters but i try to keep it short at this point so then in line number 15 i'm creating a stud string str with the sequence hello and then i'm placing two calls to make creating two new objects in line number 17 and 18. i'm using make app make of apple and passing the variable string and then i'm using make of apple and passing the stud string world which is a temporary object and now we can see the first call triggers the l value um yeah overload here in line number two as a constructor while the second call with the temporary triggers my line number four the r value overload so it's once again simply overloading and the job of stood forward is inside a template decide whether it's an l or an r value that's a forwarding reference forward that thing keeping the value category so i talked a lot about stood move um and it's time to say use move only rarely in general the compiler is our friend temporary objects i showed you that in the beginning are moved automatically this is where a lot of performance wins lay use that utilize that you don't have to do anything other than implementing your move operations 
Sometimes it's enough to say equals default or the compiler already provides you with them. So for return values, the compiler might apply optimizations such as copy elisions, uh, copy elision. You don't beat copy elision with move. Don't move return values. There are only a few instances where it's the right thing to do, but as a general rule of thumb, stay away from doing that. You will make it worse. Compilers optimizations are much better than move can ever be. Because in a lot of cases, that means that you don't get a copy, that you don't get a move. In case of return value optimization, the value will end up in the final location and be constructed there. And move doesn't beat that. One more thing is the compiler generated special member functions. So this here is a potential C++ 98 um, code thing, except for the uniform initialization. I have a class object here, which in line number two stores a pointer to an int called data. And then I have a constructor, default constructor in line number five, which allocates an int and assigns the value six to it and assigns the value of that dynamic memory to data. And then in line number six, I have the destructor deleting the data. So I'm not leaking memory at this point. And I'm not sure how many of you are, you are now screaming and saying we want a different um, presenter because that's obviously horrible. And why is it? Because I didn't implement the copy operations. I get them for free by the compiler, but the compiler does a bitewise or bitwise, however you want to see it, copy. So it duplicates the pointer, but not a memory behind it. And that means if I copy object around, I will have multiple objects pointing to the same memory. The first one goes out of scope, deletes the data, and the, all the others, well, they don't have luck. They don't have memory anymore. So Scott Myers and others taught us for years, if you touch the destructor, we should also care for the copy operations, right? Implement the copy operator and copy assignment operator as I'm doing it here. Of course, we need to do extra work. And now we have more because we have the move operations. And that brings us to this nice table here created by Howard Hinnant. Howard is the person more or less behind move semantics. He wanted to be able to write the fastest library, I think, on the planet. And um, for that, he needed move operations. And I guess he achieved his goal. So what the table does is it tells us on the top what a compiler implicitly, de implicitly declares depending on what we as users declare. And there's things in this table that you already know. So if you don't do anything, the line at the top, you get everything for free. Class is copyable, class is movable, and default constructable, of course. The destructor also is in there. If you provide any constructor, we lose the default constructor. This is something a lot of you usually know, but we get the rest. If you provide a default constructor, that one counts as user declared, and the rest remains the same. Now things start changing once we implement our own destructor. That one then, of course, counts as user declared. We still get a default um, constructor, and we get a copy of operations. But if we provide our own destructor, we now, if you look at the right, we lose the move operations. And the reason behind that is the code I just showed you. Back in 98, the committee thought it was a good idea if you provide a destructor to still let a compiler provide the copy operations. And we just saw how bright that idea turned out to be. It's in a lot of cases, not a real good thing because we are telling the compiler, we know how to destruct this object. How should it be able to know how to generate the copy operations? And in a lot of cases, it doesn't. So for move, the decision was a different one. It was, they are not there. Once you touch the destructor, they are simply not there. And this pattern continues. The copy operations now also depend on the move operations. If I implement any of the copy operations, the move operations are not declared because it's the same pattern. I know how to copy it, or should the compiler know to move it? And the Vice versa thing is a little bit different 
So if we provide our own move operations, the copy operations become marked as deleted. That ensures that if I have a class that comes with a custom copy operation, then we can still say std move. And std move will simply, because there are no move operations, do a copy. But move will never implicitly do a copy. Okay, so this is just a thing. So keep that in mind. Remember to provide all your special member functions. Earlier it was the rule of three. Now it's either the rule of five or still the rule of zero. Try to not touch um, the special member functions of your class. Fine, excellent so far. There's one additional thing, and this is often not taught, or yeah, a lot of people don't know about it, but it helps you to utilize move semantics even a bit more. And I will talk about ref qualifiers. I'm talking about ref qualifiers, I'm heading there. So say I have still the class string that I implemented that you know, and the gray parts you're already familiar with, but this time I added a new function concat to it. That one takes a const char star. And that's simply to hide the implementation because this is not vital for the slide. What it does is it concats that string with the already existing string in the class. Okay. And then we have once again the gray code, all the constructors, and so forth. And then in line number 14, I have one other new function, and that's called append. And that takes a const char star and calls concat with the parameter s. And then it returns a reference to this. So line number 14, here you can see append, of course, returns a string reference. This is what our std string does in the standard library. And how I'm using that? Simple, right? You see it on the, on the right at the top. I create a new std string or string object in my case, s with the sequence hello, and then I'm calling s.append, comma world, appending that. And then I'm printing it out. Spells hello, comma, world, exclamation mark. So excellent. That's good, right? So where's the performance win? Where can we do something? For this case, nothing. But let's look at a slightly different case. Say we have somebody who comes more from a functional programming language. And that person likes to write it like in line number six. I'm creating a string as two. And then I'm creating this temporary string here by directly calling the constructor of string put a sequence hello in it, and then I'm calling on the temporary object append for the string world. Potentially, you will not really write um, the constructor to string at this point uh, as the first part of this expression, but imagine it being a function call for something that returns a string where you want to append something to. So that return, that result of a function call that can as well be a temporary object. Okay, this here is the simplified model. Now I'm printing that one out and that works as well. So there is no bug in this code. But the thing is, this initial object containing the string hello, that's already a temporary object. And then I'm appending data to it. And then the temporary object with appended data gets copied into my string S2. Because look and left, the signature of append, it returns a string reference. So that means an L value. The compiler cannot automatically move that. We could apply std move to that thing, but I just told you to use move rarely. So let's find another solution. And the another solution is introducing ref qualifiers. So this is what you're seeing here. In line number 15 and 21, my functions have now an ampersand and the ampersand ampersand in the case of line number 21 at the end. And that stands the single ampersand for an L value the 2 percent for an R value reference. And the other thing you can notice in line 21, my append function for an R value reference returns a string ref, ref. So this is a temporary object that thing returns. While the one in line number 15 is untouched as before, it still returns an L value reference. And now this is one of the rare cases I told you about in line 24, in the R value overload for append, I'm applying std move to this because I know that that thing is a temporary object. I am being called only in a temporary object. So I move that one out. Okay. And by that, if we use the same invocation in line number six, we are ending up getting 
the move constructor of string being called and not a copy constructor. So there you can save yourself another dynamic memory allocation. So that's the ref qualifiers. You can implement only one of the two and that way disabling the other. So this is a nice approach to disable um, calls to append on the R value, so on a temporary object, but you're totally free on what to do at this point, okay? So R value or ref qualifiers for distinguishing R values from L values. The thing that gives you the additional performance boost if you really need it. Cool, move semantics. So I'm Andreas Fabek and um, yeah, my last name, I'm, I'm German. You can translate it to finish, complete or completed ready as well. So it was ready in the beginning. Now we are close to the end of the talk. So the other translations now may kick in. Um, I'm happy to tell you that I managed as I yeah, only re I revealed in, in the video I made with Kevin before CVPCon started, that I'm about to write a book about move semantics and I have a first draft online. You can go to LeanPub and grab it there. The short link here you see below, it's, it's still in writing. You can give me feedback, but the idea is to keep that book um, in the notebook C++ series. So in around 100 pages and put the essential things about move semantics in there that I often get as feedback from my training classes or yeah, my own experiences, things that I forget or, or that are really cool um, where I can squeeze out more performance. All right, um, for now that leaves me to say at this point, I am fertig. Thank you. <laughs>